morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all the speaker, chairs, and the wonderful audiences in different parts of the world. Uh, welcome to the SNS webinar. The speaker for the first session today is our honorable uh, guest, uh, Professor Miki Fujimura. Professor Fujimura is the professor and chair of the Department of Neurosurgery at the Hokkaido University Graduate School of Medicine. His clinical interests are focused mainly in the management of cerebral vascular diseases. He's a leading expert and has turned his center into a renowned facilities for the management of Moya Moya disease. He's a noted author with several publications in various peer review journals. We are extremely honored to have him today at our webinar and today we'll be, uh, he will be talking about hyperperfusion in cerebral uh, bypass. The speaker for the second session today is our honorable uh, faculty from China, Professor Fa Lin. Professor Lin is a consultant neurosurgeon at the Beijing Tiantian Hospital Capital Medical University, Beijing, China. He's, he has published seven SCI paper as first author and has approved one national utility model pattern. He's also a reviewer for the Chinese Neurosurgical Journal. We are extremely honored to have him today at our, our webinar, and today he'll be talking about epidemiological and clinical prognostic uh, research of brain heart core mobilities. The chair for the first session today is our honorable faculty from China, Professor Zhu Feng. Professor Feng is an associate professor in the division of the micro neurosurgery intervention neurosurgery at the Shanghai Medical College, Fudan University, Shanghai, China. He is also the leading expert in the field of cerebral vascular bypass and has published several articles in various peer re review journals. We are extremely grateful to him for accepting our invitation to chair uh, the first session of today's webinar. The chair for the second session of today's webinar is Professor Aaron Musa Bellu uh, from Toronto, Can Canada. Professor Aaron originally hails uh, from Albania and is currently a postdoc research fellow at the Redo Wonowick uh, Lab. Cranville University, Toronto, Canada. We are extremely grateful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the second session of today's webinar. On behalf of the Education Committee and the President, Professor Yokato, I would like to welcome both our speakers and chairs and the uh, audiences to this online platform of SNS webinar. A warm welcome to our colleague from China and we are extremely thankful to Professor Zubin for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel. And with that introduction, I will hand over this online uh, podium to Professor Zhu Feng. Professor, please. Thank you for the invitation. So I would like to thank you all for attending the meeting. And uh, today our topic is, is uh, cerebral hypertension syndrome after bypass. And uh, cerebral hyperfusion syndrome after bypass uh, surgery is a major cause of the neurologic mobility and mortality. And uh, uh, it's characterized by the headache and the seizure and the focal neurological deficits and uh, even the intracranial hemorrhage. So today we invite the doctor and Professor Miki Fukujima to talk about the cerebral hyperfusion um, syndrome after bypass. And we're here we focus on the pathogenesis, uh, and the image and the treatment and the prognosis of the cerebral hyperfusion syndrome after bypass. Professor Miji Fukushima will be our first uh, speaker. Please begin. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your kind introduction, Professor Xu. It is my great pleasure to talk about uh, this topic because I have been working on this topic for uh, quite a long time. So first of all, I would like to thank Professor Yoko Kato and all the organizing committee for giving me this opportunity. Thank you again. So today I would like to talk about the cerebral hyperperfusion syndrome after the extracranial intracranial bypass surgery. Uh, I would like to focus on the Moya Moya disease because uh, this is a very characteristic uh, complication especially in patients with adult Moya Moya disease. So, by the way, I'm from the Sapporo, Hokkaido. Hokkaido is a northern island of Japan, and it's my great honor to talk about this topic. So, I would like to begin with the uh, surgical indication of the uh, pro-augmentation bypass for the cerebral vascular diseases. So, I would like to say the bypass for Moya Moya disease had the best indication. My Moya disease has the best indication of this procedure because of the cumulative evidence. 
not only for the ischemic onset myoma disease patient, but also for the hemorrhagic onset patient has a, a tremendous benefit by the um, SDMC anastomosis. And the slides show the exact indication criteria for the, uh, of the bypass surgery for myoma disease. So based on this recommendation, uh, there is an increasing number of Moema disease patients undergoing bypass, mainly in the East Asian countries. So this is a representative meta-analysis of the surgical outcomes of the symptomatic Moema disease in adult, uh, which clearly indicates uh, direct bypass shows the much better future stroke prevention uh, than indirect bypass alone, and also the by direct bypass is reported to have a much better angiographic outcome compared to the indirect bypass alone. So there is no question that the STMC anastomosis is effective for the symptomatic adult myoma disease patient. So what about the hemorrhagic content myoma disease patient? As everyone knows, the recent evidence uh, clearly shows that the myoma patient with a posterior hemorrhage especially has a significantly high annual breathing risk. The annual breathing risk is as high as 17% in patients with posterior hemorrhage and who had the um, benefit by the STMC anastomosis. So the most recent guideline recommendation show that the revascularization surgery is reasonable for hemorrhagic onset myomitis patient, especially the patient with a posterior hemorrhage. This recommendation is based on the uh, recent uh, result of the Japan Adult Moemoya trial. Uh, if we look at the right uh, slide, uh, there is a clear uh, significant difference in the annual breathing risk between the non-surgical cases and surgical cases. Uh, non-surgical cases had, uh, again, the annual breathing risk of 17% per year, which is uh, very high, but uh, ECIC bypass significantly reduced the risk of rebreathing. So nowadays we uh, we can recommend uh, the bypass surgery for this kind of patient. This is a 30 year old woman with a posterior hemorrhage and um, we attempted uh, very standard STM MC anastomosis combined with the uh, indirect fire synangiosis. And this movie showed the representative uh, interoperative finding of the uh, STAM4 anastomosis for the hemorrhagic onset patient. As you know, that the hemorrhagic onset patient has a very fragile uh, higher artery, uh, this patient. The vessel wall is significantly thinner compared to the ordinary atherosclerotic patient. So we have to make this procedure in a very gentle way, uh, very different procedure from the, that for the uh, aneurysm patient or atherosclerotic patient. Anyway, uh, I uh, my preference is a combination of the single STMC anastomosis with the uh, encephalodulomyosinangiosis. And uh, like this patient, there is a um, favorable increase of cerebral blood flow immediately after surgery. The next question is, uh, okay, uh, again, uh, for the adult patient, uh, indirect bypass alone uh, is not recommended because most of the half of the patient of the adult Moema disease uh, does not develop the pyrosinangiosis after the indirect bypass alone. So anyway, STM involvement of the STMCA bypass is necessary for the adult patient. But the uh, question is, Direct bypass alone is enough, or the combined revascularization is better? This is the first question. So my answer is, my preference is a combined revascularization procedures instead of the direct bypass alone. So I would show the reason. There is a lot of evidence that the combined bypass surgery, I mean the SDMCA bypass with the indirect pyrosinangiosis, has a better, much better effect compared to the direct bypass alone in terms of the vascular territory supplied by the revascularization procedure and the long-term outcome or cerebral blood flow improvement and also 
direct indirect bypass has a synergistic effect of each other. So uh, a lot of evidence show that the combined revascularization procedure is uh, favorable for the adult patient. I would like to add one more reason why combined, why we uh, prefer combined revascularization. So you may know the uh, impact of the RNF213. Uh, this is a susceptibility gene for Moyamaya disease. For example, in Japan, almost 80%, 80 80% of the Moyamaya disease patient have this characteristic uh, genetic variant polymorphism. So what we found was the, uh, in among Japanese patient, uh, RNF213 variant patient has showed a much better development of the indirect bypass after the combined revascularization procedure, which means that the 80% of Japanese patient have this uh, genetic variant. So I think the, my preference is to uh, use the uh, combined procedure for, especially for the more uh, disease patient in Japan. So uh, this this clearly shows that the, most of the Japanese patient had the good uh, development of the higher uh, indirect bypass after the combined revascularization. This finding is also true among the pediatric patient. Uh, we also examined the uh, the impact of the, this characteristic genetic variant uh, in the pediatric Moyamoya disease patient. And we also found that the, the patient with uh, this variant has enhanced, enhanced pyrosynergiosis development after combined revascularization. So I think the additional uh, indirect revascularization uh, procedure uh, could have a, a good benefit. Uh, on most of the Japanese patients. So that, that, this is a reason why we prefer the combined procedure. So uh, this is uh, just the uh, introduction I talked about the general uh, surgical indication and the surgical procedure for the OMA disease. So I would like to move on to the main topic of today. So my major interesting interest during the past 15 years was the, how to avoid the surgical complication in the Moimaya disease. Because the uh, combined procedure is effective in terms of the long-term result, but um, it is also true that the, uh, it has a potential complication of the ischemic complication or the cerebral hyperperfusion syndrome. So as the, um, Professor Xu introduced, uh, several hyperperfusion syndrome is a potential, uh, very important complication in patients with Moyamaya disease. It can cause, not only cause the transient neurologic deficit, but it can result in the delayed intracranial hemorrhage or seizure, which can worsen the patient outcome. So we should avoid uh, this uh, characteristic complication in patient with Moya Moya disease. So I would like to focus on the hyperperfusion in patient with Moya Moya disease in today's, in today's talk. So at first, I, I want to emphasize that the uh, Moya Moya disease patient has the uh, much higher risk for the hyperperfusion syndrome compared to the atherosclerotic patient even after the completely the same procedure like STAM4 anastomosis, it, it is very rare to see the uh, hyperperfusion, severe hyperperfusion syndrome in patients with atherosclerosis after the STAM4 bypass. But um, a substantial number of Moimai disease patients manifest uh, the uh, uh, symptomatic hyperperfusion. So about 20 years ago, uh, many people believe that the low flow bypass uh, does not does not uh, lead to uh, hyperperfusion because of the low revascularization blood flow. But uh, what we found was, uh, if we look at this patient, this is a very initial case of my experience. But um, after the successful left STMC anastomosis with indirect bypass, 
and the patient um, develop suffered uh, uh, aphasia, uh, fluctuating aphasia two days after surgery. But I repeatedly performed uh, the single photon emission CT, but the um, several hemodynamic clearly show the increase uh, in leukemia. So uh, at the meantime, the pressure lowering was contraindicated in patients with OMI disease based on the AHA guidelines or many guidelines. Many people say uh, never, never reduce the blood pressure at this meantime. But uh, um, based on the, this finding, I mean, based on this local CBF increase, I very carefully, I very carefully lower the blood pressure in this patient. And what why, what we found was the patient symptom uh, improved, was improved after the blood pressure lowering. So which clearly indicates that the uh, local hyperperfusion is responsible for the focal neurologic deficit. Uh, another important thing is that this patient didn't have any headache. Uh, let's say after clotted endotrectomy, patient can have a parasitile headache and a seizure. That's a typical symptom of the hyperperfusion. But in case of Moyamaya disease, uh, not many, many patients don't have, don't, don't suffer the, uh, don't complain the headache, but the, uh, the neurologic deficit, which mimic ischemic attack. So it's very important, I think, to make a CVF analysis in the acute stage after uh, STMC anastomosis in patients with more MOIA disease because the management of the uh, hyperperfusion is um, completely opposite to that for the uh, ischemia. So another question is, uh, why, why more MOIA disease patient had the high uh, risk of hyperperfusion compared to the atherosclerotic patient? Nowadays, and many people consider believe that the, there is a reason, the background of Moyamaya disease, which facilitates the hyperperfusion, such as the uh, vasopolaris and the chronic ischemia. But the uh, intrinsic fragility of the vas vascular wall structure, uh, you may know that the uh, histopathological finding of the, the peripheral middle cerebral artery um, clearly show that the medial layer thin it for the compromised in internal elastic lamina in patients with Moyamaya disease. So Moyamaya disease patient has the intrinsic fragility of the pial artery and also, also the recent um, European group, European group recently reported that the Moyamaya disease patient has the uh, very fragile, vulnerable blood brain barrier. Mm. And uh, also, uh, there is an uh, increased expression of pre-inflammatory molecules such as matrix metalloproteinase 9 in patients with small MI disease. So this background may contribute to the uh, high risk of hyperperfusion. So anyway, mo uh, small disease patient has a much higher risk of this phenomenon. I would like to show some representative case. This is a 50-year-old woman with, uh, she is a hemorrhagic concept Moema disease patient. So after the very ordinary uh, SDA MCA anastomosis with indirect bypass on the left hemisphere, um, the patients showed this kind of uh, local CVF increase one day after surgery. Uh, at, on this day, a patient was asymptomatic patient didn't have any symptom um, uh, one day after surgery, but um, the next day, uh, the patient um, developed the, the transient aphasia and partial, simple partial seizure two days um, after surgery. So we suspected high, local hyperperfusion. And uh, if we very carefully look at the T2-weighted imaging here, there is apparent uh, T2 high uh, palenchymal change in, uh, suggesting the basogenic edema, uh, the territory of hyperperfusion. And uh, this is also the char characteristic of hyperperfusion. The um, SDMCA bypass is visualized by, by the very thick high signal intensity, like this case. And these um, radiologic findings 
uh, together indicate the uh, uh, symptomatic hyperperfusion in this patient. So we further decrease the blood pressure very carefully and um, use the uh, neuroprotective agent. So another important thing is uh, blood pressure lowering was very effective also for this patient. The patient gradually improved her symptoms and uh, she didn't have any additional neurologic deficit. Uh, and uh, she, she was discharged 14 days after surgery. So this is very typical, but uh, in much more rare occasion, uh, um, hyperperfusion um, phenomenon can result in the delayed intracerebral hemorrhage. In my experience of the 650 pneumonia disease bypass surgery, the incidence of this kind of uh, deleterious intracerebral hemorrhage is uh, less than 1%. So it's very rare, of course, um, to see the delayed intracerebral hemorrhage due to hyperperfusion, but we should avoid this uh, deleterious, deleterious complication in this patient. So um, if we look at this patient, the local cerebral blood flow increase was as high as 241% compared to the, the operative CBF. So uh, I think this is pathological. We found what we found in this article is a pathological threshold for the uh, delayed intracerebral hemorrhage is that local CBF increase more than the 240%. And that this uh, we show uh, we found this uh, threshold by the ROC analysis of the consecutive cases. So. Anyway, uh, quantitative analysis of C local CBF is uh, effective to you know, predict the, um, the risk of the hyperperfusion to be symptomatic. So anyway, this kind of hemorrhagic complication is rare, but very uh, critical. That's a major reason why we should manage the hyperperfusion syndrome, hyperperfusion phenomenon uh, promptly. So in this slide, I show how to manage the cerebral hyperperfusion in Moyamoya disease. Of course, most important item is the blood pressure lowering. So, but uh, every, all of you know that the Moyamoya disease patient has a bilateral pathology. So excessive blood pressure lowering is not a good idea to avoid the concomitant ischemic complications. So uh, adequate uh, prophylactic, but uh, moderate blood pressure lowering is recommended um, for a patient with small MI disease. And another thing is uh, we have some pharma pharmacological agent which can, which was reported to prevent cerebral hyperperfusion. Minocycline is a potential uh, inhibitor of matrix matrix metalloproteinase 9, anti-inflammatory uh, antibiotics. So I routinely use aminocycline in patients with more MIA disease. And also in Japan, the edalabon is a free radical scavenger, which is available in Japan. So we, uh, I use aminocycline hydrochloride prophylactically. And uh, also additionally, I use edalabon for the patient with a severe uh, Hyperperfusion phenomenon. The last thing is a low control bypass. So this is very, very special uh, technique uh, reported by the Wuhan University group. And so uh, if I have time, I would briefly, very briefly introduce these papers. So um, I, uh, I have been interested in the complication avoidance, especially focusing on hyperperfusion in Moyamaya disease, but even now, it is sometimes difficult to uh, avoid this complication. This is my most recent patient with a hyperperfusion. Even after the 15 year experience, sometimes it's very difficult to avoid, uh, completely avoid this complication. And this is a 50 year old woman with a hemologic onset Moyamaya disease patient. She had the uh, posterior hemorrhage uh, hemorrhage from the choroidal channel. 
Yes, and uh, she also had the uh, uh, severe uh, uh, hemodynamic compromise on the left hemisphere. So catheter angiography showed the uh, Suzuki's stage four uh, Moya Maya disease uh, with the uh, um, uh, remarkable development of so-called the colloidal channel, which is an um, uh, indicator of the high risk of the hemorrhage. And this is a lateral view of the ECAG, left ECAG. There is a, a spiral synangiosis from the anterior convexity branch of the middle meningeal artery. But uh, we can use this uh, palietal uh, branch of the SDA. So there is there was no uh, PCA involvement in this patient. So another important thing is the preoperative hemodynamic status. She had the uh, decreased cerebral blood flow, the uh, MCA territory on the left hemisphere, and uh, her uh, cerebral vascular reactivity was significantly compromised on the left hemisphere. So she had the hemodynamic compromise on the left hemisphere. So let's think about the risk of hyperperfusion syndrome in this patient, preoperatively. Today, we know that the patient with the uh, elderly patient or the adult onset patient has a higher risk of hyperperfusion. And also the hemorrhagic onset, uh, onset type of hemorrhage is another uh, risk factor of hyperperfusion. And also the preoperative hemodynamic compromise uh, could be the uh, risk for cerebral hyperperfusion. So which means that this patient has the uh, multiple risk of the cerebral hyperperfusion. Um, syndromes. So this is, uh, I, I would show the um, video more in, more in detail. So I uh, prepare the uh, uh, superficial temporal arteries, relatively uh, thick, thick SDA parietal branch. And uh, I make, uh, I prepare the also for the combined uh, indirect bypass. So I keep the uh, temporal muscle. So this is the brain surface. Unfortunately, I found one favorable recipient vessels here. So one of the issue is um, this patient has a thick um, uh, diameter of the STA is uh, very thick. Uh, this is a recipient artery. Uh, we can coagulate some of the uh, small branches. Uh, this is a lava seat, and I'm almost ready for the anastomosis procedure. So the uh, uh, issue is not only the mismatch of the diameter between the uh, donor recipient, but also the uh, characteristic of the vessel wall is very different between donor and recipient. This patient also has a very thin uh, vessel wall, vascular wall structure, on the M4 segment of the middle cerebral artery. But the STA had a relatively thick uh, whole structure. So this kind of mismatch, diameter mismatch or characteristic mismatch makes it difficult to uh, perform the, uh, this procedure. But anyway, uh, I made the anastomosis in a very gentle way. And um, okay, I do this kind of um, suture technique and the temporary occlusion time with uh, mm. almost 20 minutes. So. so now I completed the SDMCA anastomosis in this patient. This is very ordinary, te uh, typical technique. Um, I see green video angiography clearly show the favorable patency of the bypass. But uh, you see the local, uh, some palenchymal uh, staining of the ICG was evident in this patient. So anyway, I combined the indirect procedure in this patient and completed the surgery. So this is my craniotomy. So uh, I think that this patient had a development of the colloidal channel. So. And this, and this kind of uh, location is uh, very favorable to uh, reduce the corridor channel development. 
Oh, I anyway, I completed the the patient didn't show any symptom immediately after surgery. She was okay, but uh, next day uh, she incidentally increased her blood pressure up to the one hundred sixty mercury when she developed the transient right hemiparesis and aphasia. So at that time, uh, her systolic blood pressure was as high as one hundred sixty. So we very shortly reduced her blood pressure to the optimal level. So, and uh, there was apparent improvement of neurologic deficit by blood pressure lowering. I think this is a most important point for the diagnosis of hyperperfusion, which means uh, blood pressure dependent uh, worsening or increase of the uh, worsening of, or improvement of the patient's symptom. This patient improved her symptom after blood pressure lowering, which lead to the definitive diagnosis of hyperperfusion. So the single photon emission CT convinced the diagnosis of local hyperperfusion, local hyperperfusion here, as shown by the arrows. But um, maybe some of the audiences may have a question whether how can we uh, dis distinguish the uh, hyperperfusion and uh, seizure. Also, the uh, patient with seizure also have this kind of local CVF increase. So I would like to emphasize the, the CVF decrease on the contralateral side of the cerebellum uh, may give clue to the diagnosis of hyperperfusion. Uh, this patient has the... Uh, Cerebellum CBF increase on the right right side. There is a CBF decrease here. So if it is a seizure, um, contralateral cerebellum may show the increased CBF. So this is a, uh, gives me the definitive information for the diagnosis of hyperperfusion syndrome. So this is a MRA. Again, there is a very thick high signal intensity of the SDA, like this patient. There is no ischemic changes, but the flare imaging shows that this kind of a flare high local lesion, suggesting the pathogenic edema, local pathogenic edema due to hyperperfusion. So we make intensive care by the blood pressure control under 120, between 100 and 120 of the systolic blood pressure, and minocycline and uh, etalabone. So at one week, uh, patient's hyperperfusion was ameliorated, like this uh, uh, finding. So, so I think that the major cause of the hyperperfusion is uh, maybe patient can be symptomatic between two to five days after surgery. So at one week, um, we routinely performed the back seven days after surgery to see the normalization of the cerebral blood flow after the hyperperfusion phenomenon. So another management op option is, I personally do not employ this procedure, but my uh, colleague in the Wuhan University uh, attempted this kind of flow control bypass procedure. Uh, he um, he performed the uh, uh, side to side uh, STA M4 side to side anastomosis instead of the end to side anastomosis for the purpose of the for the purpose of controlling the uh, bypass flow and also to preserve the um, uh, STA. As you know, sometimes. STA has a spontaneous synangiosis to, to the brain. So in that kind of cases, we have to preserve the STA. So in that cases, it is also uh, useful to use this kind of procedure. So what we found was the uh, uh, side to side bypass may reduce the risk of the hyperperfusion syndrome compared to the end to side ordinary STMC anastomosis. So this is one of the idea, the surgical the idea of the surgical procedure to reduce the risk of hyperperfusion. So finally, uh, I have 10 minutes, so I want to talk about 
the pitfall, pitfall of perioperative management of Moemaya disease. If the hyperperfusion is only one issue, it's very easy to manage it because we can just decrease the blood pressure. But the um, perioperative pathology in Moemaya disease is very complicated, very complicated. So uh, we have to be very sure to avoid another uh, complication due to the different pathologies. Now, I would like to mention three issues. One, first, one, number one is uh, we should avoid the compression of the brain surface by swollen temporal muscle pedicles, the EMS pedicles. And the next issue, number two, is a watershed shift phenomenon, which is a paradoxical CVF decree concomitant with hyperperfusion. So number three is a delayed or biphasic development hyperperfusion. I would very briefly introduce these three topics. The number one is a uh, temporal muscle swelling um, used for the indirect procedure like this. Um, most of the patient has uh, some amount of the swollen temporal muscle. And uh, we, what we found was a temporal profile of the temporal muscle swelling is like this. Day one to three may, uh, temporal muscle volume may maximize at the day one to three, and uh, which may decrease time sequentially in this case. But uh, in this acute stage, um, if the swollen temporal muscle is too uh, significant, too big, so uh, a patient would have a problem. Uh, please look at the left, in this case, the first case. She has the uh, temporal muscle swelling, moderate temporal muscle swelling. The patient has the, uh, of course, the improvement of the cerebral blood flow here. But uh, uh, one week after surgery, the temporal muscle swelling increased, improved, improved. But uh, according to this improvement of the temporal muscle swelling, the cerebral blood flow further increased seven days after surgery. So. And uh, we have to understand the balance of the uh, brain surface compression and the um, transient um, CBAP increase um, immediately after surgery. So um, we show the uh, result of this uh, complex pathology by single photon emission CT. So if the temporal muscle swelling is too, um, too severe, uh, CBF, may decrease, further decrease, and the patient could be symptomatic. Another number two is uh, this kind of, um, how to avoid the concomitant ischemia. So this patient has a severe local hyperperfusion. So we decrease the blood pressure, but uh, consequently, this patient has the uh, remote and ischemic lesion like this. This is my uh, relatively initial case, but the, Anyway, this is a, we have a dilemma to uh, manage the hyperperfusion in patients with Moemaya disease. So again, the excessive, uh, too much blood pressure lowering is not recommended for the patient with hyperperfusion to avoid the ischemic complication. So finally, we come to understand uh, this uh, phenomenon, which is a watershed shift phenomenon. So what is watershed sh shift phenomenon? The answer is that uh, this is a paradoxical cerebral blood flow decrease adjacent to the local hyperperfusion. Uh, please look at the result of postoperative day one. She has apparent local hyperperfusion here on the right, right hemisphere. But if we very carefully look at the remote adjacent cortex here, there is a paradoxical cerebral blood flow decrease. This is a quantitative uh, data of the cerebral blood flow. So she had the concomitant local hyperperfusion and uh, uh, paradoxical uh, ischemia uh, due to the watershed shift phenomenon. So uh, if we find uh, if we find the local hyperperfusion, we should be very careful to see whether the blood pressure lowering can improve the symptoms or deteriorate the symptom. So we have to make sure that the blood pressure lowering improves the patient's symptom. Uh, otherwise, we, we can miss this kind of a very important 
apologies. So number three is the delayed cerebral hyperperfusion. So delayed hyperperfusion is that something like this. The day four uh, prolonged hyperperfusion. Or in most cases, the hyperperfusion phenomenon can be improved um, seven days after surgery, but some patient has a prolonged cerebral hyperperfusion. In this article, we found that the RNF213213 mutant patient uh, has a much higher risk of the prolonged cerebral hyperperfusion. So again, the um, analysis, genetic analysis of this uh, molecule is uh, useful uh, to predict the uh, perioperative pathology. And this is another report uh, recently published by our group. Um, you may know that the, not only hyperperfusion, but the, after the revascularization surgery, the Moemai disease patient showed this kind of uh, uh, laminal high intensity by the flare imaging. But the um, patient with this uh, genetic variant has a much prolonged uh, presentation of this kind of uh, rare high signals compared to the patient without the genetic variant. So it's very interesting to think about the underlying pathology, this kind of different uh, response after the uh, uh, revascularization procedure anyway. So uh, this is uh, almost the last slide of my presentation. So perioperative management of Moyamaya disease is very difficult because of the co very complex pathology. But uh, um, again, I would like to emphasize that the uh, avoidance of the cerebral hyperperfusion is very important. We can manage this phenomenon by the blood pressure lowering or by this kind of uh, anti-inflammatory uh, antibiotics. But excessive blood pressure lowering can result in the ischemic complication at the limo contralateral hemisphere or the, even at the same hemisphere due to the, the watershed shift phenomenon. So uh, it's very uh, critical to perform the uh, cerebral blood flow analysis. And it is very important to confirm the patient's symptom after the blood pressure lowering to see whether it was effective or not. So finally, I would like to conclude that the Flow augmentation bypass, I mean the STMCA bypass, is reasonable for symptomatic Moemai disease patient, either ischemic or hemologic onset patient. But the local cerebral hyperperfusion is a, is a potential complication, which may cause a focal neurologic deficit, seizure, or a delayed intracranial hemorrhage. Number two is we recommend routine CBF measurement in the acute stage after revascularization surgery for Moyamaya disease to avoid surgical compli complications in this kind of a very complex perioperative pathology. And finally, the prompt blood pressure lowering and a neuroprotective agent like uh, minocycline, edalabon, and flow, uh, flow cell regulating side-to-side STMC anastomosis could reduce the risk of cerebral hyperperfusion in Moemaya disease patient. So I, I want to acknowledge, I want to thank all of my colleagues in Hokkaido University. Or well, before moving to Hokkaido University, I worked uh, uh, on Moemaya disease for a very long time in Tohoku University in Sendai, uh, where the first professor of Tohoku University, Jiro, Professor Jiro Suzuki, named this uh, intrinsic disease um, as Moya Moya disease. And I also thank the international colleagues for um, performing the, the clinical research of OMR Davis. Thank you for your attention. It's all of my thoughts. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Professor uh, Fujimura, for giving us such a wonderful lecture about the cerebral hyperfusion syndrome following bypass surgery. And uh, uh, <clears throat> it told us uh, uh, <clears throat> the hemodynamics 
measurements and uh, the treatment uh, such as uh, the blood pressure control and uh, antiplatelet agent uh, or flow regulating such, light, uh, such as the side to side bypass to prevent the cerebral hyperfusion syndrome. So I, I have a question. Uh, so if uh, when we perform the bypass, the donor such as the STA, the diameter of the donor is much larger than the recipient. So if the ratio of the donor with the recipient uh, diameter is uh, more than three or four. So did you perform the direct uh, the bypass? Oh, or thank you, Professor. Uh, that's a very important, uh, excellent question. So uh, mismatch of the diameter of the donor artery and the recipient is very critical. Uh, as you suggested, uh, some patient has a very big donor artery and very small diameter of recipient. In that case, uh, I agree that uh, it, it can um, be very dangerous to perform the STMC anastomosis in the ordinary way. So in that kind of cases, I dissect the STA for more than uh, 9 centimeter, 10 centimeter, and I use a very peripheral peripheral part of the uh, STA to uh, minimize the mismatch of the uh, donor recipient uh, diameters. So maybe I make an effort to make the uh, peripheral STA diameter of two millimeter or two to three millimeter, and then I would attempt the STA MC anastomosis. Thank you for the critical question. Thank you. So, is there anybody who have questions? Probably I can ask this question for myself. Uh, professor, uh, yeah, uh, professor Fuji, uh, thank, thanks for that very excellent uh, lecture. I have a two questions for you, Professor. Uh, first, first uh, is, uh, what is your uh, timeline uh, when the patient develops uh, acute function or, or hemorrhagic uh, bleed uh, due to Moya Moya? How long do you wait? Uh, before you perform a radiogram and a surgery. Uh, my okay. my second question uh, re regarding a patient who already have a pre-existing uh, 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 ECA, ICA, and anastomosis in the angiogram, uh, how best uh, when you want to perform a bypass to avoid a direct interruption to the pre-existing anastomosis? Thank you, Professor. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the two excellent questions. Uh, the first question was a hemorrhagic onset patient, right? So uh, we wait at least for one month uh, after the hemorrhagic presentation. The uh, study design, uh, inclusion criteria of Japan adult moemoya trial of, for the hemorrhagic moemoya disease was a patient uh, one, one to 12 months after uh, hemorrhagic presentation. So, uh, which means that I usually we at least wait for one month to uh, confirm the reduction of the peri uh, hemorrhagic uh, edema or something like that. So my my answer is uh, I should I believe to wait for one month. One month. For the next que question, that is very critical question about the transdural pre existing transdural collateral. Uh, from the, for example, the middle meningeal arteries or occipital arteries. Of course, we should preserve this kind of uh, pre existing transdural anastomosis uh, during the procedure. So, three point fixation, position of the three point fixation is very critical to avoid the uh, damage of the occipital artery, of course. And uh, I, I personally make a small parietal craniotomy if the patient has a very uh, developed uh, uh, middle meningeal pyrosynangiosis. Um, but uh, usually the parietal part, parieto posterior part, has the uh, avascular. Usually the transdural collateral comes much later on this, uh, at this area. Uh, that's the reason why the uh, choroidal channel has a high risk of bleeding. So anyway, I may, I avoid the 
craniotomy uh, on the area of the pre-existing transdural collateral and make a relatively moderate to small craniotomy at the parietal side and make a, a, a such as a target bypass to the uh, uh, um, frontal or parietal uh, m segment. That's my uh, answer. I definitely um, preserve the transdural collaterals. Thank you very much, Professor. Hopefully we can invite other panelists. Uh, Professor Tashi uh, Kon, Takashi Kon. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fujimura. Um, the great picture. I'm Dr. Kun, uh, Showa University, Tokyo, Japan. I would like to ask you uh, I was, I was one question. So, as for uh, seizure, a uh, hypervascular uh, 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 hyperperfusion syndrome is to avoid. Uh, uh, um, we have to avoid the, such complications. So, as for seizure, a uh, postoperative seizure, how do you manage the uh, intraoperative phenytoin management or after levetiracetam or other anti-epileptic drugs? Uh, thank you. Thank you. That's very clinically, very important question. Thank you. Uh, nowadays, I use the lacosamide, lacosamide, lacosamide. And, uh, lacosamide uh, natural channel blocker, uh, prophylactically. Uh, prophylactically. From the, Post and pro post day zero, the, day zero. Uh, not only for pre not only for avoiding the seizure, but mm -hmm. also for the such kind of uh, neuroprotection, protection. to protection. control the cortical spreading depolarization or management mm -hmm. of the kind of a complex pathology. So I believe that, uh, uh, as you suggested, the uh, anti-epileptic agent is very uh, important uh, mm -hmm. for the perioperative management of myeloma disease. Thank you. So uh, using also edarabon also. I don't know, bon, just intraoperatively. Intra I, I use okay. Edalabon, just intraoperatively. But if mm -hmm. patient has a very severe local hyperperfusion, mm -hmm. uh, we additionally use Edalabon for maybe a couple of days, about three days. So ah, okay. basically, thank we you. use aminocycline. Yeah, okay, thank you. Aminocycline. Okay, thank you. Takashi uh, Kon, uh, Professor Edon, do you would like to ask any question? Fujimura sensei, thank you so very much for your wonderful talk. It was brilliant. It's uh, it's from A to Z coverage of Moya Moya disease and uh, the detailed explanation of not only surgical uh, exploration, but as well the, the treatment methodology of complications following surgery. Thank you so very much for being here with us today. And uh, I take advantage to thank uh, the organizers for putting together in this order diseases that affect the cerebrovascular system, but at the same time with our following speaker, Dr. Lin Fan from China, that's going to share his experience on the epidemiology and clinical prognostic research of brain, heart, comorbidities. Um, it's it's a seldomly touched topic, but it's a very important topic. We usually find this topic discussed by our, our colleague anesthesiologist, but when in the field of neuroscientists, there is a neurosurgeon that finds it uh, interesting to conduct research that makes it even more valuable. Dr. Fa, I thank you very much for being here with us today. And I'm uh, together with my colleagues, I'm all ears to listen to your work in regard with uh, research that you have been conducting on brain, heart, comorbidities. The stage is yours. Uh, please uh, join us. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Aaron. Uh, good evening, professors and experts. Uh, my name is Fa Lin from the Department of Neurosurgery, Beijing Tiantan Hospital Neurosurgery and Capital Medical University in China. And today I will show you uh, guys a topic about a new area epidemiological and uh, clinical prognostic research of the brain heart comorbidities, also known as the a uh, BHC. I will introduce uh, my topic from these four aspects. And due to the pathophysiological characteristics of the atherosclerotic changes, cardiovascular and the cerebrovascular disease, present a background of similar etiology with the aging of the population and the increase of the disease burdens, as well as the contradiction between the treatment of the hemorrhagic stroke and the ischemic stroke with the heart disease. 
and uh, clinical diagnosis and the treatment has been troubled. Also, the concept of uh, the BHC has not been um, definitely established. Uh, research has identified notable correlations between the brain and heart. Research endeavors in this field predominantly encompass the following areas, such as the brain-heart connection, access interactions, or brain-heart syndrome, stroke-heart syndrome, among others, providing inspirations for the future uh, investigations. And the attention to the BHC has been increasing in recent years, and this uh, lack of uh, important databases related to the BHC. At present, uh, this is a Jiro DPC database in Japan, which focuses on the research of the heart and brain comorbidity and uh, has published more than 30 articles since 2016. And there is also a TreeNet Tags database in the United States, which has produced nearly 400 articles based on the health research network of the more than 60 medical institutions in the U.S. It can be uh, seen that the construction of the international BHC database has just started. And we can see that at the, la at the end of the last year, the European Heart Journal published a prospective th three clinical studies, which observed a cor coronary microcirculation status of 63, uh, 67 patients and found that patients with the coronary microvascular dysfunctions had impairments in MRI, TCD, and cognitive skills. And for the mechanism studies uh, published in Science this year in May and the circulation research in June, the main result is the brain and heart are closely related and interact with the, each other's with a causal relationship from the heart to the brain, mainly through the joint influence of the artery brain circuits and the heart brain circuits. And above two studies also provide a, night, a new perspective for the intervention of the brain and heart disease by network neurosurgery. And BHC exhibits a significant case fatality rate and the disability rate. Within China, the percentage of the mortalities attribute BHC and is associated with ailments among the Chinese populations surpasses 40% thereby surpassing the corresponding numbers of the tumors or other illnesses. In order to promote the clinical work related to the brain-heart interaction, the World Stroke Organization, led by the Professor Bersato Luciano, set up a brain-heart working group, held a lunch meeting with our hospitals during the epidemic, and uh, issue a joint project statement in June, nam namely BEAT program. So what have, uh, what have we done to address these complicated situations? Initially, uh, we have led the uh, est establishment of the multiple uh, collaborative diagnostic and uh, treatment centers in China, including the institutions like uh, Beijing Tian Hospital, Shanghai, Huashan Hospitals, and the Beijing Anjing Hospitals, among others, uh, leveraging China's fourth five-year plan for development, we collaboratively formulated and endorsed the uh, standards data site BHC. At our Beijing Tian Hospital, you can see we have uh, created a center for simultaneously treatment of the brain and heart disease. And this is an interdisciplinary uh, disciplinary approach to patient's care, and not only facilitate comprehensive treatment, but also advances our research endeavors in uh, BHC. Furthermore, we have constructed uh, 
extensive data repositories for clinical uh, research on BHC drawing from the various hospitals and communities. This is a comprehensive collect collection of the patient information um, provided the robust data uh, support uh, for our subsequent uh, investigations. Uh, you can see that the Chinese official media uh, CV, uh, CCTV has reported on the integrated diagnosis and the treatment of BHC at our hospital, and thereby simplify the process for patients to access the medical assistance. Uh, the next part, I will introduce that how we uh, act to the uh, plan. And in China, we and we came up uh, five significant concerns and the etiology of the BHC remains uncertain. So it is crucial to ascertain their um, prevalence and the uh, natural progressions and the prognosis and how should the patients with BHC to be managed. And the third one is who is responsible to the BHC and we require non-invasive, swift, and accurate markers. And the fourth question is that who will develop a BHC? And the fifth question is that we require novel therapeutic targets for BHC. And to address this in crisis, uh, in collaboration with the uh, hospitals in China, we incorporated the BHC into the national plan. And this is an initiative. Uh, this is an initiative um, to examine the Chinese approach to manage these patients. Uh, we will systematically address these five critical issues through six distinct tasks. In text one, uh, we will establish the industry standard for the BHC data site. Uh, subsequently, uh, we will. Uh, develop a data management technology for the clinical research for the BHC Big Data Warehouse based on the multiple centers. Following that, we will construct a, a scientific research management platform to explore different uh, efficient operational procedures and the mechanisms for the data sharing. Uh, for the text two, we will conduct the research on the high risk prediction models of the AI assistant the BHC and the clinical decision support systems. We will establish and refine the automatic identification systems device uh, predicting models for high risk um, patients, create a CDSS for prevention and the treatment and ultimately validate the prediction softwares and the CDSS. Uh, moreover, we will undertake two clinical studies focus on the treatment strategies of the BHC based on a hybrid uh, platform, integrating the neurological and the cardiological perspectives in TAC3 and TAC4. And this endeavors will uh, enhance collaborations among the neurosurgeons, neurologists, and cardiologists, and others. And text five uh, assumes the uh, a a responsibility of exploring the pathogenesis of the BHC. And given the highest uh, prevalence of the atherosclerosis, we will investigate the metabolic markers of the brain heart sclerosis. And this research will offer new laboratory methods for clinical searching and uh, screening and uh, prevention that's uh, laying the groundwork for the study of the disease mechanisms. And the next uh, task and the task six is aims to resolve the issue of the high risk pre prediction models and the treatment strategies for the population at risk of the cardiogenic stroke. We will establish uh, risk models and uh, disseminate scientific and uh, technological achievements 
the study group has already released a uh, Chinese uh, experts concerns on the ultrasonic diagnosis of the PFO. Uh, all projects are making study progress now. And the third part, I'll share our a uh, little bit uh, progress in the uh, BHC areas. Uh, you can see that this is our result from the outpatient department. Um, it is established in the March 2019. Um, by the March um, 15, 2023, a total of 13,900 patients received treatment amounting to more than 21,000 visits. Among them, uh, more than 4,000 patients sought treatment on the multiple occasions, accounting for more uh, more than 30% of the total. Uh, out of the nearly 6,000 patients diagnosed with either the brain or heart disease, 42% had a brain disease. Uh, well, 80% had heart disease. Uh, additionally, 22.5% patients were diagnosed with the, both the brain and heart disease, uh, with the more than 23.1% uh, of them requiring uh, hospitalizations. We strong, strongly uh, recommend that the uh, patients suspected of having the BHC undergoing the brain heart CTA, and we have obtained more than 3,000 results thus far. Uh, you can see that the numbers of the patients uh, expected a consistent upward trend over the years, indicating an enhanced awareness of the BHC among patients. Uh, furthermore, um, patient volume varies uh, with the seasons with a uh, higher influx uh, uh, observed during the spring and the winter months. Uh, the analysis was uh, based on the little bit uh, identifications and uh, diagnosis. We set the ICD code for cardiovascular disease like uh, ischemic heart disease for I. 21, 22, and 24, heart failure for the I-15, and arrhythmia for I-48, and the aortic diseases for the I-71. Uh, for cerebral vascular diseases and the cerebral infections for the I-63 uh, and the uh, intracranial hem hemorrhage for the I-61 and for the SH uh, for the I-16. Mm, this is our preliminary st uh, statistical analysis. Um, and for 4,775 patients diagnosed with the heart disease, reve uh, revealing that 28.1% uh, of them had uh, concomitant BHC. In comparison to the patients with the heart disease alone, those with the brain heart disease uh, tend to be male and older and present with a greater number of the complications. Among the 2,509 patients diagnosed with the brain diseases, 53.4% percent of the patients were found to have BHC in the male genders advanced age and uh, increased comorbidities are common characteristics observed uh, in the brain heart patients. And those findings align with those of the heart diseases. Consequently, with a uh, patient diagnosed with the BHC exhibits a uh, higher likelihood of being male uh, at advanced uh, age and uh, experience increasing medical cost and uh, complications with uh, compared to the patient diagnosed with the other the um, prevalent heart, heart diseases. And the uh, most uh, prevalent is the uh, heart disease is the coronary artery disease, 
uh, while the cerebral infections represent the most uh, uh, frequent occurrence among the brain diseases. Um, patient history regarding to the hypertension and diabetes mellitus, hyperlipidemia, or hyperhomocystemia and hyperuricemia were recorded uh, through the uh, univariant analysis. We can see that the hypertension and the and, and diabetes mellitus and the hyperlipidemia were uh, found to be associated with the BHC after uh, adjusted for factors such as the age or gender or hypertension and uh, DM and uh, uh, hyperlipidemia remain significantly linked to the occurrence of the BHC. Uh, although the proportion of the uh, diabetes mellitus cases is relatively low, uh, it exhibits a strong uh, association with the BHC according to the multivariant uh, analysis. Um, to uh, investigate further um, patients who were classified based on the number of the risk factors. And it was observed that uh, incidence of the BHC increased uh, incrementally as the number of the risk factors rose. Uh, notably, uh, patients with the two risk factors displaced a uh, higher uh, proportions and the relative higher incidence of BHC. And therefore, individuals with risk factors should be closely monitored to prevent the development of BHC, especially those with the multiple risk factors. And this is another result of our um, preliminary analysis. Uh, between April 2019 and uh, March 2023, a total of three, more than 3,000 patients underwent the brain heart CTA. After excluding the patients with unstable heart rates or the ages range of, um, uh, range of the patients fell between the 24 and the 91, with an average age of the uh, 59, and the data showed the higher proportion, uh, proportion of the male patients. We can see that the main result of our uh, analysis, the prevalence of the artery occlusion or the severe uh, stenosis or the triple vessel lesion of the coronary arteries and the atherosclerosis stands at 5.6%, uh, 18%, and 4.9%, and 43.7% uh, respectively. Atherosclerosis is the most common pathology among patients with the brain heart conditions. Our uh, primary focus of the analysis lies in to the stenosis, pla plague, and atherosclerosis, and the stent in the brain, neck, and the heart. The incidents demonstrate that uh, upward uh, trajectory from the brain to the neck and to the heart. This implies that the development of a uh, sclerosis follows a trend uh, from the heart to the brain. Uh, Align with the uh, science in this year's uh, uh, for uh, cultural relationships. Uh, among patients, uh, Diagnosis with the heart disease, we can see a little summary and the prevalence of the brain heart disease is 28.1%. And in patient diagnosis with the brain heart uh, brain diseases, the prevalence is the, uh, 53%. And BHC predominantly affects individuals aged uh, 60 years old or above. Uh, this is uh, possibly due to the heightened influence of the risk factors on their vasculature. Uh, old patients necessitate uh, increased uh, tensions. Uh, male patients exhibited a higher perspensive uh, for the BHC and hypertension, the mellitus and hyperlipidemia 
uh, significantly associated with the BHC and should be closely monitored. Uh, individuals' uh, uh, treatments warrant uh, careful uh, considerations. And CDA data pertaining to the brain heart conditions uh, reviewed the occurrence of the atherosclerosis following a trend from the heart to the brain. And uh, ca cardiovascular relations may uh, serve as a foundation for the secondary vessel diseases. In the fourth part and last part, uh, we I will briefly outline the future perspective for the uh, research on BHC from two perspectives. First one is the um, brain and the clinical research and uh, and the bioinformatics. And to attain high quality evidence for clinical research, it is imperative to conduct multi-center large scale and uh, long-term cohort studies, preferably prospective cohort studies. Uh, for the most uh, compelling evidence, RCT within the cohorts can be conducted. And the prim primary aim of the clinical research is to uh, focus on the diagnosis, treatment, and the prognosis of the BHC. Now we have in, uh, registered a uh, BHC in uh, China studies in clinical trials. And secondly, uh, in the realm of the uh, bioinformatics establishing a uh, specialized uh, databases dedicated to the BHC holds uh, great importance. And this database should emphasize on the phenotypes and the uh, SMP associated with the B BHC. Uh, additionally, expanding this uh, databases to include metabolic uh, data and the mo mo molecular drug targets uh, can be found valuable insights into the shared biologies between the brain and heart. Uh, conducting the multi-organ and the images genetic analysis is uh, uh, highly recommended. And that concludes my presentations and uh, we will still face many cha challenges and I'm eager to continue exploring the BHC alongside with all of you. Uh, and thanks, thank you very much. Dr. Lin, it's... Uh... Yeah. It's my pleasure, and I guess I share the same thought with other colleagues to be here today and uh, attend your 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 talk. Uh, a wonderful work you have done with your colleagues, and I'm very impressed by the results that you showed. Um, to, to share a thought, I happened to attend uh, yesterday at the Barrow Neurological Institute uh, a joint round of neurology and neurosurgery. Um, uh, the presenter was uh, Dr. Wal uh, Walter Koroshatz. Uh, Dr. Koroshatz is a neuroscientist and current director of the of the Neuroscientist Institute at the National Institute of Health in U.S. And to cut the bottom part is that that currently two leading diseases with the highest morbidity and mortality are heart and uh, brain and i see that you have combined those in one i very much hope uh, that you will be joined in this quest not only by the colleagues in hospitals that you mentioned but by more because we need a lot of research in that area uh, to understand what brain can uh, can be affected by heart disorders and how to prevent this heart and cardiovascular disorders to affect the brain. On, on your presentation, I realized that uh, you have come with some results and it, it, it still remains that diabetes mellitus and hypertension are two of the highest more, more, more um, risk factors that affect both heart and brain, which remains the same across across all uh, both fields, brain and cardiovascular. Uh, I do not have any specific question for you. You had a, a very detailed presentation. You did not leave room for any question. But I have a request. Uh, here, uh, here uh, <clears throat> not only in Toronto, but across North America, it has always been an interest to, to extend cooperation with colleagues abroad, um, 
my main research focus has been in, in the cancer biology of brain tumors. But uh, on, on the other side, I've always had an interest in stroke. Stroke is a broad, uh, a broad uh, pathology that includes and has the need to cooperate with colleagues around the world. And I would be very interested to ask if you and colleagues there in your hospital are, are interested in the near future to cooperate uh, with uh, some other centers where we can study, we can combine forces to study stroke pathology, not necessarily in the brain, but brain and cardiovascular combined. Yes, of course. I think I'll have uh, I'll have your contact later from Dr. Liu. Now I'll have the panel open for other colleagues uh, to interact and if they have any questions. I think uh, yeah. I also would like to commend uh, for a great work, uh, Ali, uh, Professor, and then uh, definitely be be happy to encounter this uh, often but more uh, result uh, from uh, many initiatives that we have shown to us. Uh, actually, actually, uh, we have actually missed the concluding remark for, for the first first lecture. Uh, yes. Professor uh, Fujimura and Professor uh, Zufeng is still around uh, uh, with us, uh, Professor. Yes, uh, uh, my apologies, uh, Professor Fujimura. Uh, uh, this, 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 uh, probably we can hear, uh, also while waiting, we can hear a concluding remark for the first lecture from Professor Zufeng, uh, Professor. Yes, uh, sorry, we missed your concluding remark for the first lecture, Professor. We thank, we thank the Professor uh, uh, Fujimura for a very nice lecture. Uh, since there's no further question, uh, probably we can hear a concluding remark from Professor Arion for the second lecture, Professor. Dr. Dio, thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank the colleagues here today, and I, I will extend that special thank uh, on my turn to Dr. Lin Fa for his wonderful work. It was a true pleasure and a, a professional privilege to attend today's seminar. Uh, Dr. Fujimura and Dr. Fang, thank you so very much for your wonderful work with the first part of our lecture. As always, thank you very much to the to the ACNS for putting together this wonderful work and today in a special order, cerebrovascular and then cardiovascular and brain. It's uh, it's wonderful. I, I see the success is always here and I see it's always growing. Dr. Fa, uh, it was my pleasure to chair your session and attend your lecture. And I wish you every success in your future research and clinical work. With that, Leo, thank you very much to you and the organizers. And I wish everyone you have a great rest of your weekend. So we have come to the end of today's webinar. Uh, on behalf of the Education Committee of the SNS and the President, Professor Kukwato, I would like to thank both speakers of today, Professor Fujimura and Professor Falin, as well as the chairs for today, Professor, Zuf, uh, Professor Zufeng and also Professor Irion uh, Musabili, and also the time and support uh, for the SNS webinar. I also would like to express uh, my sincere gratitude to Professor Zubin for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel. So until we meet again uh, next, I mean uh, uh, tomorrow, this is bye bye from all of us. Thank you, uh, Professor. Thank you for joining us and uh, goodbye.